All right, so hello everyone and a warm welcome to this first European Citizen Science Cluster event. I'm thrilled to be here today with you. I will be your main moderator. So my name is uh, Florence and I work uh, at Sticky Dot. Sticky Dot is a collective uh, based in Brussels uh, with expertise on uh, multi-stakeholder engagement in research and innovation. And I'm excited to guide you through this event alongside with my colleague, Carmen, who will be in charge of the logistic. So if there is anything that doesn't work out, uh, please ask her. Uh, and together we are committed uh, to ensuring a successful, smooth and engaging event for all of you. Uh, so with the number of participants that we have today, we kindly ask you to keep your microphones uh, muted throughout the event. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, we encourage you to use the chat function. Uh, however, please be attentive as I may occasionally invite you to raise your hand um, for a direct questions to our speakers. Uh, also, if you wish to tweet about the event or screenshot some of the presentations, uh, please don't forget to, to use our uh, project handle EU SITSI project. Um, so here's the today's agenda. So the event uh, consists of two parts with a lunch break scheduled between 12 and 1 CST time. The first part of the event uh, aims to provide you with an overview of the topic which will include presentations uh, showcasing the ongoing work of different initiatives and actors who will share with us some practical experiences, findings, and takeaway messages about citizen science in higher education. Uh, for the end, sorry, for the second part of the event, um, the objective is really to discuss uh, ways together for supporting citizen science in the higher education sector. Uh, from thinking about how to address challenges that structures that support citizen science universities currently face to how to make a supportive environment uh, for early career researchers. We will have group activities, so uh, which will provide you some opportunities uh, for you to interact with your peers and share your thoughts and ideas. So also make sure to stick around until the end. Uh, because we'll have some final thoughts from Gabriela Leo, uh, policy officer at the European Commission. I will also like to remind you that it's only this first part this morning that will be recorded and uh, will publish later on on the EU citizen science platform. Now, uh, more specifically for the agenda for to this morning, uh, we will have two notable opening presentations, first by Stein Delore, uh, policy officer at the European Commission followed by Claudio Fabo cartas and Clea Montanari, both working on the European Citizen Science Project. Afterwards, we will have two talks that revolve around the integration of citizen science in the higher education. Uh, we will have, right after, a short coffee break to refresh our minds and to immerse ourselves again in three other presentations showcasing um, projects focusing on citizen science and uh, operating within the higher education sector in Europe. Now, just a few words about the yearly ECS cluster event. This is our first uh, event this year. We will have one more in 2024 and the third one in 2025. And the goal of the cluster events are to present and highlight the work and the remarkable achievements of, of our vibrant citizen science community to a broader and more diverse audience. This year, uh, this year event focuses on exploring the role of citizen science in universities, how to support it, and how to make it widely adopted as a standard aspect of higher education and academic culture. Um, and this topic was chosen because citizen science has the potential to significantly transform the higher education system in the European Union, making it more sustainable and inclusive. Additionally, we know that the European Commission is actively working to provide support for the uh, higher education system, enabling it to effectively respond to uh, the changing needs of our society and the economy. So we really, really hope that uh, this event today will serve as a valuable space for gathering knowledge, fostering a meaningful discussion about this uh, important topic, and also for sharing a general uh, appreciation for the work that is already underway in this field. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to hand over the virtual floor uh, to Stein Delore. Uh, Stein is a policy officer from the Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, uh, working in academic research and innovation policy, 
supporting uh, the future of universities in Europe. Uh, following his presentation, we'll dedicate a five minutes for question and answer. Um, so thank you very much, Stan, for being with us uh, this morning. I will now uh, let you um, the floor and also the control to share your screen. Okay, here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmen. Very good to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, so I work in the uh, unit of RTD responsible for the era spreading excellence and research careers. And this also includes policy related to higher education sector. For that, we are working very closely together with uh, colleagues from uh, DG EAC, um, the unit responsible or in charge of higher education, uh, obviously. Now, um, I will ask, uh, I will tell you a bit about uh, the support we have provided so far in terms of policy as well as program for universities and what will be coming next uh, in the future as well. I will uh, take you uh, briefly to the era. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're, you're very familiar with it. Um, but for those who are not, uh, allow me to say briefly uh, what the new era is about. It is, of course, uh, the aim, the idea, the concept of going to a single market for knowledge. And since end of 2021, we are implementing uh, the council's wish to have uh, to pursue four priority areas for the era, the realization of era in 20 actions. Uh, you see here the so-called era policy agenda, and uh, which is uh, implemented and overlooked by the ERA Forum, an expert group of member states, stakeholders in the commission. Um, and on the left side, you recognize probably several of the actions. Uh, it's about open science, about reform of research assessment, gender equality, stronger research careers, knowledge valorization. There is also a dedicated action to bring science closer to society. And the one I'm going to highlight today is Action 13. Um, in full, we, the Council asks uh, or, or calls to empower higher education institutions to develop in line with the European research area. Um, there are two objectives of this action. One is uh, to help universities, higher education institutions, to implement the ERA priorities achieving excellence in science and value creation through inclusive cooperation. The second one is to align or coordinate member states' efforts to bring their own higher education sector at national level to a higher level, to a globally more visible and more competitive level. So for that, we, we have uh, a policy approach that the Council called for uh, through an, a so-called ERA Forum subgroup, which is also an expert group consisting of member states, stakeholders in this case, uh, university umbrella organizations and, and the Commission, uh, chaired or co-chaired by France uh, Coimbra Group and uh, the Commission. We have quite some studies and analyses of um, priorities uh, to, to reach excellence, uh, mapping excellence initiatives at national level, modeling these uh, and so on. We have pilot projects uh, and quite a few. It's uh, almost difficult to talk about the pilot. Uh, I'll come back to that as well. Uh, and experts. Now what we are building is a toolbox, uh, which is called the European Excellence Initiative, a toolbox consisting of policy support to member states, and program support to uh, universities. So far, we have uh, dedicated almost 100 million euro in research innovation coordination support means uh, to alliances of universities, uh, about 40 alliances of European universities, which you probably know about. Uh, it's the Erasmus initiative to build integrated inclusive cooperation of universities. We also provide eight other alliances of universities and in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, 12 more uh, will, will arise. We provide uh, funding for three acceleration projects. These are projects of uh, entities, universities and um, other, other uh, entities to provide counseling to other universities in the many era priorities. So basically helping 
university sector in Europe to make progress, to build strategies, implement action plans in the era priorities. Um, and the main areas that we have asked the universities in this support to work on are the following. Uh, developing a common RNI agenda, trying to align uh, their strengths, sharing resources, especially sharing infrastructures to make the use of it more efficient, stronger human capital, including a balanced talent circulation, reinforcing knowledge valorization and the capacity to do so, mainstreaming open science practices, as well as engaging citizens and society. And finally, exploring joint university structures. And for many of these areas, uh, the universities made a lot of progress. So it's a group of more than 300 individual universities uh, gathered in these alliances. And we did uh, an assessment of the impact of the support globally. I mean, um, over the entire support, uh, as well as an individual uh, assessment of the, the, the projects, the individual alliances. And the conclusion is that uh, in all these alliances, the individual universities benefit, make progress in ERA priorities, in, in the one, especially the ones mentioned here. All alliances address human capital, uh, most address the engaging citizen uh, society, and all, uh, as I said, all institutions gained. I give you now uh, a bit of more details on this and focused especially on the citizen science uh, uh, area. So um, there was a large survey of these uh, pilot projects uh, in, the, in the past months, and uh, overall, it has helped significantly uh, progress to the university to make progress in, in transformational module six you see here uh, at the bottom of the slide is about the embedding citizen society engaging citizens so the uh, mo majority of um, respondents uh, reacted that it somewhat helped them and one about one third said it very significantly helped them in making progress in this uh, area. We observed that there are greater benefits for widening countries or entities in widening countries, as well as, and that's in the next slide, for smaller institutions. I have to explain to you that these alliances are built in a very specific way. It is, they had the assignment to uh, making an integrated cooperation of entities from North, South, East, West Europe. So they are geographically very inclusive, as well as in type of institutions. There are higher education institutions that are comprehensive, other, others that are more focused on specific themes. Some focus especially on higher education and want to make uh, progress to become more research intensive and so on. It's, it's quite diverse uh, audience, but they collaborate in, in in an inclusive manner. And here you show that uh, in this slide and also the second slide is that uh, in blue uh, here, uh, the institutions from widening countries benefit most. Um, and here for the same picture for smaller indication. This means that the um, inclusive model is um, creating sharing of practices and bringing the, those who are a bit lagging behind and want to make progress actually make a lot of progress by the cooperation. Uh, and this model is something that we're going to explore further in the future, obviously. So an inclusive cooperation uh, and all of, all of the higher education institutions evolved benefit and those who are lagging behind make a greater jump. It's more than the sum of its parts, basically, uh, this, this type of cooperation that, that is uh, induced. Now, also the individual projects were uh, evaluated uh, through another uh, study. And here you see the progress of some of the progress made by the European University pilot projects from the first generation. These are 17 projects on open science and citizen engagement uh, with a lot of best practices. And this uh, report is published, and there is a link in one of the previous slides, and you're, uh, I invite you to, to have a look at it. 
So in terms of engaging citizen society, there were courses provided, workshops uh, created, webinars uh, for researchers and citizens. They made use of existing practices and tools that were available uh, online uh, from previous projects funded under Horizon 2020. Toolboxes and guidelines were sub, uh, set up and communities of practice on citizen science and peer learning within these alliances have been formed. Overall, uh, the alliances are strongly encouraged to, to go further uh, in, in the initiation, initiation of, of these uh, progress in, in the many era areas. And as well, uh, remarkably, the experts uh, recommended to uh, step, recommended the alliances and the universities to step out of their academic silos further, engage even more with the regional research innovation ecosystem, other actors uh, surrounding their environment. Uh, because the alliances, of course, have been inward looking, trying to consolidate the cooperation, making progress in era priorities, and especially on higher education. And now they are called for uh, open your eyes and, and engage more with, with society, with innovators and, and, and companies. Now, what's next? Uh, using this evidence, the expert group in the Era Action 13, the Era Forum subgroup, is now uh, designing policy support tools for member states to actually engage with their own national sector and build excellence, set up national excellence initiatives, for instance, um, considering uh, co-creating support to raise excellence through framework program uh, goals, um, and also aiming for more coordinated support with member states and between member states uh, to support the sector in the different era priorities. So I leave it here. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, for inviting me to speak at this uh, event. I wish you all the best and a lot of success with, with the event and uh, the events that are still coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan, for this presentation. I don't see any questions in the chat, so and we have a bit of time for a question and answer. So if there is anyone in the, among the attendees that would like to ask a question or a comment to Stain, uh, please raise your hand uh, and I will give you the floor. Any questions? It's Monday morning. We still have to wake up a bit. Yes, Stain. Oh. We have a question from Meg. Uh, she says, how has citizen science been defined? Um, using the definition um, from previous projects, um, we what we actually did is provide uh, suggestions uh, to the alliances. Um, we suggested them to follow, uh, to actually work on these uh, seven areas that, that were in the slide uh, before. Um, and and we, we fine-tuned this a bit because they had many questions. Um, what specifically? So in this so-called guidance note for applicants, we have prepared uh, references to, to citizen science, uh, previous uh, tools that have been developed using the language uh, from the citizen science community, uh, actually the colleagues from uh, uh, Gabriela and Leo, uh, who, who will speak later on, um, have been involved in these suggestions. We can, could not control if they actually followed this, so um, it was a suggestion because we wanted to keep it at bottom up as much as possible. So many of them have taken up uh, the tools and um, uh, structures that have been developed uh, before. Thank you, Stein. Um, we have one question from Rosa. Thanks, Laurence. Uh, yes, I have a question. Maybe it's in your slides, but it was a lot of information to read on a Monday morning. So uh, my, my question is, um, are the university alliances working on the recognition side of the practice uh, to promote the citizen engagement as uh, one of the objectives? And uh, if so, uh, are they pushing these institutional changes that are required uh, to, to foster the practice? Thank you. Um... For the first part of the question, um, I invite you to read the report.
because there is a lot of detail and also best practices on how they actually did it. I must say, I, I don't know by heart. Um, for your second question, the entire support that we provide is actually to induce institutional change in these era priorities. So their deliverable is the implementation of actions plans that lead to that change. So they could choose the priorities, but we gave the suggestions. So most of them have included engaging citizen strategies um, and, and um, reaching out to companies as well. Uh, this was another area that we suggested and strengthening uh, human capital, as I said. So um, a lot is happening, uh, but this is a, a long-term process. Not only do they have to implement this change at their individual universities, but we asked them to do it as a cooperation. So in the previous years, they have been working on this cooperation, integrating, aligning uh, structures, uh, trying to build a, a true European university, a single entity. So it will take some more time, uh, but uh, the overall assessment is that they are really on track, that there is a satisfactory progress on all areas. Uh, and we are looking forward to, to uh, the consolidation phase that they are now entering. Thank you very much. Um, we have one last question first. Uh, some people in the chat would like that if you can share the link to the report uh, in the chat, that would be great. And I will just finish with one question from one of the attendees. Uh, Bruna asks, communication between academia and society is very poor. How do you plan to increase and facilitate this aspect? Um, very good question. And uh, if I may, I will leave this to, to my colleague Gabriela Leo to, to answer because she's in charge of the policy. We are actually implementing it at the level of higher education sector. So, but what I can say is that uh, most of the uh, alliances, I, I repeat myself, um, are doing a lot of effort to, to actually engage citizens and, and, and do the actual citizen science. So please read the report. I'll, I'll send this, the chat now in the link in the chat now, uh, because there are practices. Uh, they are, and I warn you, it is, um, it is a midterm review of the pilot projects. But and so it's actually impressive what they did in this very short time. Uh, for many of the areas, including the citizen uh, science and citizen engagement one. So um, for the future, we will continue this support um, as citizen science is one of the era priorities. Um, and so th there is a call under WIDERA uh, that, we, that tar is targeted to alliances of universities like the European, univers European universities, but not, not only. Um, so where we support these alliances with uh, up to 5 million euro to consolidate this um, uh, implementation. Um, we are convinced that more practices and more alignment will, will come from this. This is our expected outcome. On top of that, we should not forget that we are here for the science, for the research. Um, while the support we have provided so far is targeted to the governance level of higher education institutions. In the end, we want to create critical mass for research and innovation. So what we are trying to experiment with now is um, in, in the current call that closed in, in April is to also provide seed funding to these alliances to fund researchers, fund research, which can include uh, concretely uh citizen science when it where it fits so up to 20 percent of this budget per, per project can be used for small collaborative research projects to jointly uh, host or uh, appoint postdocs and so on it's up to the alliances to do that with this tryout we are seeing if um, the alliances model not only works in making institutional progress weaker institution catch up faster, but they all catch up in era priorities. But we also uh, want to see if, if uh, funding research in this critical mass that we are generating, uh, well, generates added value for the RNI system as a whole and, and citizen science will, will be a, a part of this. 
Thank you. Gabriela, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, just uh, as Stina called me <laughs> on the floor. Uh, okay, I will uh, um, show you in my final remarks uh, what uh, uh, what we are doing to facilitate the more than the communication between academia and uh, society. We we are pushing for co collaboration and. Uh, uh, co-creation of uh, research, uh, uh, research topic, research activities. So, and uh, we have a project in the Waidira call, but also um, we mainstreamed mainstreamed the citizen science approach uh, in all the uh, cluster and mission of uh, uh, Horizon Europe, and. Uh, uh, we launched also other uh, exercises, the motor learning exercise on citizen science, and now we are launching a new uh, ex exercise on societal engagement. So there are several um, initiatives at policy and, and program level uh, that should and uh, uh, address the to um, improve this collaboration. Uh, I will give more detail uh, at the end. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Gabriela. And if if I may add, um, I forgot to say that, of course, within these uh, projects, they have been inward looking so far. But in the next phase, we we ask them to uh, bring on their national, uh, sorry, their local innovation ecosystem within the project. Uh, this means other actors, including citizens, including uh, other societal actors and companies. So whatever they do, it build strengthening human capital, they have to do it together with their local ecosystems. So you get you create actually a, a big network of not only universities, but all their, also their surrounding partners uh, to circulate talent, to make sure careers become more interoperable, and at the uh, level of knowledge valorization to make sure there is knowledge circulation with the local ecosystems. Uh, so building not only an alliance, but building uh, a cross-border ecosystem of, of talents for talents and, and, and knowledge. So this is, uh, because of this assignment, they will be better in communicating between academia and societal actors. Thank you very much. Um, we have no more time for a question, uh, but as we said, uh, Gabriela will be with us um, this afternoon around 2.30. Uh, so uh, please stay until the end. And again, thank you very much, Tain, for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. It was a great introduction to the topic. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Claudia Fabo-Cartas, project coordinator of the ECS project, and Clea Montanari from University of Paris Learning Planet Institute uh, to take the virtual stage. Again, following their presentation, if we have time, we will have uh, five minutes for a Q&A. Uh, Claudia and uh, Clea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Florence. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for having us. We'll talk a bit about the ECS and European Citizen Science Project and the European Citizen Science Academy. So the project of um, ECS now going, giving you a bit of an overview is to widen and strengthen the European citizen science community through capacity building and awareness raising activities. And we do this with the vision of a globally connected, inclusive and strong citizen science community for societal change in Europe. For some details on the project, this is an Horizon Europe funded project, is a coordination and support action that answers to the topic of a capacity building and brokering network to make citizen science an integral part of the European research area. And the project is both about or on citizen science in the sense that we are building capacity for citizen science and infrastructure to support it, and also doing citizen science activities ourselves. At a glance, this is a four-year project. It started uh, last August, runs until July 2026, meaning that we are almost one year in. We, the consortium of 12, part, 12 sorry, partners and nine affiliated entities represent 15 countries 
And also notable to mention is a network of 28 citizen science ambassadors that we are currently setting up to support um, the activities and the project and advance citizen science in Europe. You see here all of the partners in the consortium and the affiliated entities. So in terms of um, what ECS um, does, the project has numerous trends. Um, some of them map onto work packages, um, more or less, so I'll read it um, aloud. The project is expanding the reach of citizen science by strengthening the community, enhancing digital skills for fair and open science communities, further developing the EU citizen science platform through co-design, developing the ECS Academy with free training to increase the capacity to conduct citizen science, boosting inclusion and diversity for mainstreaming citizen science. This is a cross-cutting um, topic in the project, advocating for citizen science and working on policy impact. And last but not least, investigating the impact of citizen science on research, society, and economy. So ECS ambition is not only to strengthen the links between citizen science initiatives and other research actors and practices, but rather to embed citizen science on an institutional level. And the project will do so by a mainstreaming and introducing citizen science to new types of actors, such as young researchers, small and medium enterprises, industry, and researchers from underrepresented fields in citizen science. And so what, we'll, uh, what Clea and I will concentrate in our presentation this morning is this aspect, the Citizen Science Academy, and how this links to um, the higher education sector in Europe. So citizen science, as you've been he hearing from um, Stein, is, um, has become an important mode of research and innovation in Europe and worldwide, and it has gained recognition across policy, research funding organizations, scientists, civic society organizations, and those working in the interface of science and society. And so today, citizen science associations and platforms, as well as conferences and funding programs are key promoters of participatory forms of scientific knowledge production. However, citizen science is still limited in its uptake and acceptance across disciplines, actors, and institutions. Citizen science has the potential to play an important role in supporting the higher education system in the EU. And to some extent, um, we've heard European universities as are venturing into this field. And we'll hear more about this from speakers later today in the program. But despite the potential advantages, citizen science is not yet widely adopted as a standard aspect of higher education. And so one of the objectives of the ECS project is to build the capacity to conduct excellent research and innovation through citizen science. The ECS project aims to support a step change in ensuring European RNI maximizes the importance of citizen science by establishing a European Citizen Science Academy with training courses developed on practical and theoretical aspects of citizen science and providing training and capacity building activities for key actors and institutions. The project aims to achieve this, um, the integration of citizen science methods into leading research projects and within the academic curriculum across disciplines and as a result of these targeted efforts. And so it will build on the EU Citizen Science Platform to create the European Citizen Science Academy that will increase the capacity of actors through these three um, lines of action, co-design activities, leveraging the training modules within dedicated and trainer-led sessions, and also linking to missions, clusters, the SDGs, and the Green Deal activity to tailor dedicated training packages, facilitating the integration of citizen science. And as um, many of you would have uh, heard, there's evidence in the literature that in many cases, problems in quality and quantity of data are linked to avoidable um, errors in the design. This also applies to citizen science. And so one of the aims of the academy is to provide the appropriate training to ensure that appropriate principles are integrated in early stages of project design. ECS aims to increase the capacity to conduct excellent research and innovation through citizen science while maximizing also other potential benefits of it. And so we will explicitly target early career and excellent researchers to provide the appropriate education to the people who can then share these lessons and spread it across the scientific community. And with this, the project is contributing to the overall empowerment of the community through capacity building for excellent research in the European research area. Also in a more 
um, higher level or different level um, effort will be dedicated in the project to work with national funders who focus on the excellence theme and working with them to identify the policy aspects that need to be addressed to support citizen science on the institutional level. Um, and the project will contribute to reform, enhance and open the European research and innovation system, deepen the European research area to a greater, greater quality of scientific production and stronger translations of RNI results into the economy. And with this, we aim to facilitate improved knowledge for policymaking, boost synergies between RNI and higher education policies and programs, and modernize the higher education sector. And my colleague, Clea, Clea will tell you a bit more about the Academy. We can hear you, Clea. Thank you, Florence. Is this good? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, really nice to see you here. So like Claudia mentioned, I work specifically uh, with Muki Hakley on the Academy on Work Package 4 of this project. And the um, European Citizen Science Academy um, is a virtual entity associated with EXA, which will aim to facilitate build capacity, as Claudia mentioned, and accelerate training in citizen science. So we want to do this, and we are doing this at the moment uh, via a network of citizen science educators and trainers, um, via developing and giving trainings, and being a point of contact for educators and trainers, uh, and also a repository of training materials on the EU citizen science platform. Um, some during the project, there will be courses um, that are training materials that will be developed and built uh, specifically for these actors. So different research and innovation organizations such as libraries, um, museums, research funders, research translation organizations, and also research performing organizations. Um, then also training materials for a network of researchers that are um, considered in top research, such as MSCA, Marie Curie, Marie Clodaska Curie Actions, sorry for the mispronunciations, and the Marie Curie Alumni Associations, ERC grantees, and the European Young Academy. And also with a focus to newcomers in citizen science with training um, guides that will specifically help in uh, contribution to high policy goals such as the EU Green Deal or the Sustainable Development Goals. Claudia, next slide, please. Um, so like I mentioned, we just kicked off uh, June 1st, actually, a network of educators and um, citizen, sorry, educa educators and trainers in the citizen science field. Um, so we did this via sending a survey out to individuals that we had identified uh, that are engaged in citizen science education and training and also different listservs. And we got a total of 129 responses. And of these, about 49% respondents were actually researchers and academics, um, 76% of them answered that they, they had experience in providing training or teaching in citizen science. And 74 of them mentioned that the training was generally uh, linked to universities, museums, or research centers. The next slide, please. Um, and also what we asked in the survey was what individual trainers and educators would need to actually thrive. And more broadly, what European citizen science trainers and educators needed to thrive. Um, and it was highlighted that there was a need of support and recognition of citizen science by higher education institutions, um, by, for example, giving greater visibility for courses within universities, and also have just more resources. And that the academy could actually play a role in promoting and showcasing the added value of citizen science and, um, and demonstrate its added, va added value sorry, for social contribution, educational, and research aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia and, and uh, Clea, for this presentation. I do, do I, we have a question? We do not have questions in the chat. Um, if we don't have questions, but there are some that appear in the chat, I will ask Claudia and, and Clea to answer them directly. Um, so what I would like to do now, before we move on to our next speakers, uh, I'm always curious to know a little bit more about the people who, who attend uh, events. So I will be, would love to know where all of you uh, joining us today are from. Uh, so for that, uh, Carmen, if you can share the Padlet um, 
on your screen. That would be great. Uh, and we will use this Padlet to get a visual idea of our current locations. So as you can see on the screen, and I will share you the link afterwards, um, you will have a plus button uh, at the bottom of the screen. When you click on this button, uh, you can either write the city where you are right now or the country. Um, also, if you are representing a university or a research institution and you would like to showcase, uh, to, get, to showcase it, please uh, feel free to write it down. So I'll share with you uh, the link to the Padlet you should be able to, uh, to access it and to write uh, your location. If there is anything, please write in the chat. Uh, we will fix the problem. Uh, and let's see, let's see how this map uh, gets filled uh, with the location you give. We'll give, uh, I'll give you a few minutes to do so. We'll start seeing appearing the locations while you're entering them. We're starting to have one location. Uh, so you don't have the link. Okay, one second. Okay, you should be able now to see the link. Sorry about that. We have people from Germany, Vienna, Berlin, Paris, Brussels, London, Netherlands, Ljubljana, Oxford, Milan, Budapest, Roma. It's great to see. Lisbon, Madrid, Nigeria. Amazing. Very happy to see that we are crossing borders uh, out of Europe in this event. Cambodia, um, welcome. It's great. It's it's great because it shows the vastness of our community, uh, but also how widespread uh, we have uh, for this or well, a wide a widespread interest in this topic. Um, so that's great. Amazing. Well, a big shout out to uh, to our attendees in Southeast Asia. That's great. Lovely. All right. Um, so I would like uh, now to uh, move on to our next speakers. Uh, so we will have presentations of two speakers now. Um, and once we've heard from both, uh, we will dive into a Q&A session. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Maria Aristeidou, uh, who is assistant professor at the Open University. Uh, she's also chairing the Citizen Science and Universities Working Group of the European Citizen Science Association. Uh, welcome, Maria, and uh, the floor is yours. As you know, this presentation, uh, you should be able to access it by um, clicking on, on the arrow to change the slides. Thank you very much, Florence. Can you all hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Thank okay. you. So thank you very much. As Florence said, I, I am I'm coming from the Open University, but I am also here as uh, a member of the EXA Working Group on Citizen Science and Universities that has been doing some work on this area. And thank you very much for inviting me and the group to represent um, some of the work that has been done in this area. Um, so to start with, uh, my work around citizen science started by wondering what kind of learning gains people receive when they um, take part in these citizen science projects. Um, so because of that, we started conducting a systematic literature review on what different researchers found about what their um, participants learned in their projects. And we were not surprised to find out that there were 
a large range of learning gain, starting from um, people having revised attitudes towards science. So they would start to have positive um, attitudes towards science. They will start to like science and start thinking differently about what science is, but also start to better understand the nature of science that is not like a solid truth. It's not a yes or no, but it's an entire process that involves risks. Uh, standard procedures, peer review, and many revisions if needed. Um, we, also, we also figured out that, of course, the participants have some increased science knowledge over, entire, over the entire science. Um, so they would get to have more identification skills as many of the projects, the citizen science projects, ask participants to identify things or recognize patterns, but they would also get to understand more about data, uh, how to manipulate data and how to read data. And, and then, of course, they would learn more about the specific topic of the citizen science project. So they would learn about the concepts of that topic and the language used in this topic. And then they would get they would get to complete tasks around this topic. So they would engage and get more familiar in that particular topic, which can be from biodiversity to energy to medical sciences to any kind of topic. And then finally, something that we didn't have in mind but came up was about contributing to their, their genetic knowledge. Um, so, of course, people have to collaborate and communicate through forums and other means to uh, conduct the citizen science activities. So that would develop their communication skills, but also they would it would develop their English, mainly English uh, language skills, as many of the projects are available in English, but not all the people are native English speakers. So they would get to learn English more and more by just taking part in a citizen science project. And because many of the projects are also uh, taking place online and they are available geographically uh, to many people, they would also gain this digital literacy because they, will they would have to learn how to use the tools and the platforms and the different technologies to collect or analyze data. So, Overall, there was a personal development putting together all of these different aspects. Um, then I suppose our, our question was whether all these benefits apply to young people who take part in citizen science projects. Um, and we started looking into that. Um, in the Learn Sci project, which was a collaboration with non-academic partners. So we got to engage people, young people across the US and the UK in um, participating and learning through citizen science projects online and in the field through long-term projects or bio blitz as one of projects. Um, so again, we were not surprised that young people, in the same way as adults, they would also develop scientific knowledge and skills. But there was also a surprise. We realized that in the projects that young people contributed to, they would contribute in a different way compared to adults because these were mainly biodiversity projects. So young people would get to um, collect data mainly on different species, smaller species, and species that adults would not be as much interested in. So we realized that we, we could use in science uh, young people to give us a different perspe perspective on um, the data collection or how we can engage with science and the data. Overall, from the Learn Seed Site project, 
uh, which allowed us to get access to people that we wouldn't be able to have access to as universities, uh, but museums and natural history museums have more access to the general public. We realized that young people would get to develop agency while taking part in this project. So they would start to identify as scientists and want to start scientific careers. Um, and they would also transfer their knowledge, what they learned on different fields and areas in their lives, for example, for school exercises or for going to the university. And they would also develop ownership and responsibility over community and environmental issues. So they would get to gather their friends and start a mission, like looking in their communities and neighborhoods across different things, how we can improve this, how we can address this issue. And that was great. Um, and then we we saw these uh, European Commission announcements a few months ago that is actually talking about all these skills that we, we identified already when looking at what kind of benefits we can have from citizen science. Um, so indeed, um, we were looking at how to develop highly skilled people, adults and young people, that can have high prospects for employment and can be engaged with their environment. And this is what we have identified in our project, but also citizen science, uh, the way we uh, received feedback from people, um, we understood that it could be more inclusive. It could make science more inclusive and more digital. Um, but also engage people more with the environment and how to address sustainability issues. And that was without effort. Like we noticed that we were addressing that because just because of the nature of citizen science projects, this is what citizen science is trying to do. In the meantime, we were actually looking at how universities engage with citizen science. Um, so we started collecting evidence from different works across the world as to how citizen science has been embedded in higher education and some examples of that. And we gathered work that has to do with um, citizen science that has been embedded in the curriculum, but also citizen science projects that have been initiated by universities or um, they have been initiated by projects in universities and decided that they will be engaging students in those projects as well, but also with um, citizen science projects that involve the community and they were trying to support work that has been uh, going on in the community. And these, um, in the slide, you can see some areas that these works focused on. So they focused on learning and skills through citizen science projects, attitudes towards citizens to, towards science, digital skills. Uh, and these are things that we also um, encountered in our previous um, work. But there were also discussions about how we can use citizen science to connect young people to the natural work, how we can use it to increase inclusion and perspectives in science, and how we can use it as a way to discuss quality in science and quality in data. So to look into these areas, um, when it comes to improved learning and skills acquisition, some of the works focused, of course, on how they enhanced knowledge and the course content um, in the university course that they were studying and they embedded citizen science activities into, um, but also, again, how they got students to understand more about the nature and processes of science. And then it was about data literacy as well, as we mentioned before, students learn how to use data more effectively and how to write about these scientific experiences they have. Um, they learn how to have more uh, biodiversity skills and more knowledge on the topic. And that was in a different way, not just by following the university, the curriculum book, but by also integrating other kind of activities in the actual course by using citizen science projects and activities. So when it comes to change the attitudes towards citizen science, 
it wasn't only about increasing interest in learning and doing science, but it, it was also about increasing the motivation of people in the course, making the course more interesting. And students actually reported to have more enjoyment and engagement in the course by using the citizen science activities. And not only during the course, but many of the students also reported that after the course has finished, they were all already engaged into all the citizen science um, aspects that they just wanted to continue doing it, even if it was not part of their course anymore. Then when it comes to digital skills, some works engaged students who were not in science uh, faculties or disciplines to actually build more mobile phone applications for community projects. And that was in particular about counting apple trees in one of the communities. Um, and that was a collaboration with a community small scale university. So the students got to know more about how they could engage the community in this project and what kind of technologies they should be using to increase uh, citizen engagement in that. Um, and then again, other projects and other works focused on evaluating the technologies of current citizen science projects and become critical about how these technologies uh, can increase or can uh, focus on engaging people and get them to learn more about a specific science topic. And then there was also a discussion about how these different designs can contribute to different learning and engagement outcomes. So it was, it was very nice to see that students can be critical as to how we can change the designs of the project to uh, target specific goals and specific learning and community gains. Um, then looking at the connection of students with the natural world, students would get to also build physical and virtual collections, which is one of the main things that citizen science projects do, especially when it comes to biodiversity monitoring, but they would also increase their outdoors engagement, which is not very um, common when it comes to university courses. You get to be in the classroom um, with all the people and the whiteboard or blackboard or interactive board, but you don't get to be that much out there. Um, and in that way, they got to face these ecological challenges and be there in having real world experiences through field work and through actually contributing to science. And then it was all about inclusion and perspectives. Many projects were talking about being able to include people that wouldn't be otherwise included in science and in citizen science. So the university includes a range of people coming from different cultures and backgrounds. So it's kind of the right place to find people that come from different uh, different spaces and get them to contribute to science and contribute their different perspectives into science. Uh, and in that way, you also offer them some professional development skills. They have already contributed to real world issues and to real world projects. Um, and also citizen science, it gets you to have an inclusive way of integrating activities into schools. Uh, and not only into schools, but also involving the community in these co projects and contributing to the community in the same way. And it, it was quite nice to see that different universities or different programs, different faculties or universities with non-university partners and other institutions would come together for these citizen science activities. So it wasn't just the perspective of the university and the academics and the way they would plan the project, but it was like merging all of these ideas and all of, all of these backgrounds and cultures into achieving something. And then another, another part of it was the quality. So we want to develop more critical citizens that they can take ownership and they can be responsible for this. But these young adults, they have to become critical in, in order to address what's already out there, the challenges that are out there. So some of the programs and works they got into um, 
uh, engaging students into being critical around many aspects. And one of those aspects were about, about the role of the expert in citizen science. So there would be discussions around what is an expert and who can, who can be an expert in citizen science and in science. Is it anyone? Is it any of you? Is it just students or just academics or just researchers? but also they would get to become critical about data quality and validation tools. And they would get to have examples of different data validation tools and express their worries about each uh, one of these tools and how they can actually uh, validate and how we can actually have quality data to contribute to science. And of course, throughout all of this, there was some training for quality data collection and analysis. So uh, reflecting on all these different areas and reflecting on how citizen science can contribute to universities, but it can also contribute to students and the communities. We, we, were, um, we were thinking that indeed, uh, without a lot of effort, it could address some of the new policies uh, or renewed policies that the European Commission would like us to focus on about strengthening universities because citizen science has already been in universities and we have seen what kind of benefits it, it can offer not only for universities but also for the communities that around the universities or more general the community and the environment. Um, and, and that can come from collaborations between different universities, between universities and the community. And it can also contribute not only on students having benefits for, from that, but also from people and the public have benefits from that. And it can also benefit science because in this way you get different perspectives from students who have different backgrounds, but also from the public who got engaged in this university initiated or collaborative university, non-university projects. And finally, they could also get all kinds of different digital skills by just uh, taking part in this project. And this digital transformation has been very important, especially in the last few years, especially for getting into employment. And of course, they would also get all these um, all these um, benefits, let's say, to get them to understand how to address the sustainability issues that we have nowadays and how to address all of these problems we face with community issues and with environmental issues. So I am I'm always so happy to be invited here to talk about these things. And I am really looking forward to see what other projects have been doing in relation to this topic and what other different areas they identified into how we can use citizen science to benefit universities, but also how to benefit from universities. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for this very insightful presentation. Um, we will now move on to our next speaker. Uh, his name is Dr. Fernando Villarino. He's Associate Director of the Computer Vision Center and Associate Professor at the Computer Science Department of the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Uh, he's the Research Field Coordinator of the ECIU Community of Citizen Science and coordinates the co-creation process for three pilots on citizen science at the SMART project. Uh, again, thank you very much, Fernando, for being with us. And I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much to you. Do, do you mind if I share the slides myself, if I can? Uh, sure, you can share your slides. Uh, give me one second. I will give you, I will allow you to share your slide. You should be able now. Yes, thank you very much. Fantastic. So for me, it's a great pleasure and, uh, to see also um, all colleagues working in the area of citizen science. And uh, I have to say that there is a number of things that I just collected from the previous presentation that I would like to link. So I did a very, very quick approach to the particular initial presentation as well and a, an, an update that I would like probably to discuss later with you because I, I see that we are very much aligned on that. So I'm sharing 
my my slides now. Uh, there we go. All right. Oh no, this is the last one. Let's start for the for the beginning. There we are. Okay, so what I would like to introduce today to you is the um, approach. Uh, we were talking about pilots first, right? The, the, the approach for the co-creation of citizen science that we have been developing in the ECIU Smarter community. Um, this is some uh, 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 work that is ongoing. It's not finished yet. So you have a possibility of having an impact on that if you're willing to. So you're very much welcome to, to provide all the feedback if the, the things that we are sharing to you are of your interest. I think that they are very much aligned, as I mentioned, with, with what we have heard so far. So um, which are the objectives uh, the, of ECAU citizen science priorities and timeline from this year's matter? Okay, first of all, ECAU is a European university. It's a consortium of European universities and a smarter is a specific project in order to develop this virtual institute. Um, in, in addition to a number of, of work packages that I will definitely identify for you in, in a moment, I would like to highlight three specific um, aims that we are having with the ECIU smarter. First of all, is in the context of citizen science, right? So the first of all is to develop a community the development of a community of mutual learning for citizen science. This was our first objective, to try to, um, to build up, to create it, and to consolidate it with a number of instruments. Second, this community is a community of doers, not only a community of people speaking. So the idea is to develop a number of actions funded um, supported by a co-creation of pilots and use a digital platform and a number of methodologies in order to co-design and implement citizen science pilots in the context of our European university. And the final aim is the transformation, is to get the evidences that are, we are getting from these pilots in order to fit for a number of recommendations and to change the European university for good. So uh, in a nutshell, without entering into much detail, you can see that the SMARTER project uh, would be in, in the context that approaches to citizen science would be something like that. We are having this platform, and from this platform, we are going to aim at developing a number of citizen science pilots in which a number of European universities are participating, researchers. So it's a bottom-up approach, not a top-down approach, as usually we are having in European universities. So this is one of the first things that I would like to highlight. This is a bottom-up approach, the creation of the community. Since we are researchers and uh, project managers, it is very important to align them with research fields that are relevant for every of our universities. Then, and it was mentioned in the previous presentation as well, capacity building opportunities. This academy approach is that very much necessary because not only citizen science, but anything else is not happening for free. We need capacity building in order to consolidate a strong approach, not only for citizen science, but, all, but also for, for the engagement of the citizens, but also for the engagement of all the public actors, meaning public administrations, other scientific uh, actors, and also uh, private sectors. So there is a... a <clears throat> component, sorry, <clears throat> of public engagement that is necessary to develop on that. Then, of course, we have our outreach and dissemination and the consolidation of a, a number of opportunities for funding based on the pilots. So this is the idea, to try to make it sustainable. And um, in order to make it sustainable, we have to change things, we have to transform what is happening in our European universities. And for that reason, we are developing a number of recommendations. So this is the project uh, in a nutshell, this is just a part, then we have an element of governance for this virtual institute, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to focus explicitly on what is about the, the pilots that we are going to, to, to develop. I ask you um, a little bit of your attention for these uh, different stages in which have, we have divided the approaches for SMARTER. Remember that our first, first action is to build up a community within our universities, a community of researchers that are already working in citizen science, and um, for those who are new and we want, we want to uh, get into uh, citizen science approaches. 
Our context is uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 11, which is associated with small cities. So what we have been doing is first, in order to engage this community of researchers uh, for citizen science in CIU, we started with a number of webinars on citizen science. Then once we have a, a small critical mass of let's say uh, 20, 30 researchers identified, mapped in our universities, we had this co-creation process for science, citizen science transnational pilots. And this was this, the aim is to share from the different universities research in different countries. Then we, we, we had second critical mass, which is which are the research topics in which we are interested in order when we want to contribute with our time and passion. Then we had the pilots design and we created a methodological approach in order to do it. Remember that part of this was in, was in the pandemics. So it was a lot of fun, but very, very much uh, also intense, let's say. So then we have the, the pilots running from uh, 1st May 2022, uh, pilots that were funded with this project and the pilots, pilots are expected to be concluded in September 23. So we are really, really close to there. And uh, this is the, the general approach. Please keep in mind this picture because we, I will use it during the rest of my presentation. So as I was mentioning, the first step is for creating the, um, the community of researchers within the UCIU University was to start identifying and welcoming people in order to create some topics on citizen science. Um, this is essential because we need the alpha users, the, 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 the researchers that are able to attract other colleagues and other members of the community in order to start building up the community of citizen science. So we, for that reason, we identified a number of webinars within three months and within three months, it allows us to identify those who are really willing to contribute and we're really going to go further on that. So this is the, the, the initial step. We have everything on the website. You can click the QR or we can, you can also have access to the, to the link that I am provided if you are interested in the topics with, that we have mapped and in the identified at the beginning. So the second ingredient, now that we're having a community of interested people, is to have some place to meet together, right? And some kind of organized approach to uh, methodological development. And for that reason, we created this initial platform which, in which we had a toolkit, we had um, a, a forum for questions and answers, and, um, and all the information was gathered there. So that, that is the meeting point of the community that we already created that is being enlarged. So this is important that, uh, to, to, to understand that this is more than a showcase of a web, website. This has to do an actual place in order to have the freedom to discuss and to have the freedom also to, 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 to say something that not everybody is agreeing with, right? So it has to be kind of a safer space. And this is what we created with the toolkit and the, commu the community of mutual learning in the forum. Um, so now we are, eventually this is something that it is created beyond the ECIU official website, but it is expected to integrate it afterwards in the official ECIU website. So the tool. So with this toolkit, what we are having is a co-creation methodology that we will release uh, by October when we are um, um, developing, um, we are presenting the conference for the ECIU research and the Smarter Project. In this co-creation methodology, we are describing the, 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 let's say the four steps that we, uh, it, we understand that we are needed in order to feed this community of mutual learners on citizen science. The first, the first point is the, the general approach to, to the platform, then to identify and mapping the activities locally, then to try to go for a co-creation workshop. And uh, we have the methodology explain on how we did it online for more than 154 people divided in rooms and so on. It was a lot of fun, you have to believe me. And after, after that, what we had is the design of a number of pilots that would run for between 12 and 18 um, 18 months. Once we had that, we had uh, the, 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 let's say the identification of people who wanted to commit with their time and, uh, um, and own projects, and those who wanted to commit their time, even though they did not have any backing projects behind. <clears throat> For that, we had some resources. <clears throat> so again, 
nothing is happening for free. And some uh, we identified in the in the project a small, uh, humble, let's say, budget in order to distribute among a number of researchers that applied in principle for two pilots, but then we had three pilots uh, instead of two, which was what was written in the application. But we made all the efforts in order to be to make sure that the three pilots were funded, and uh, we have three hundred and sixty thousand euros that were distributed in these three specific pilots. One is Citizen Arenas for Improved Environmental Quality and Resource Use in Smart in Cities, which aims at, with the, the leadership of CIOs the coordinator, also the ICTA UAB, et cetera, gathers a 17 researchers in six ECIU universities in order to tackle from different perspectives the citizen science projects, some of them with schools, some of them with cities, um, in order to tackle this environment quality and the use of different resources. The second project with no general order is establishing a community of empowering, inclusive and equitable citizen science within ECIU. This was more let's in, in practical citizen science projects, but a more theoretical approach on how to develop inclusive methodologies for citizen science from a systematic point of view. This was very relevant because we have a number of researchers that are, we are already contributing in this area. So we have 18 researchers that are developing different sub-pilots, let's say, um, um, uh, in the context of ECIU. And finally, but not least at all, is the empowerment of urban cyclists through citizen science. It's a project coordinated by ICTA UAB, in which we are having seven universities with 14 researchers. And what they are doing is in some way to try to use citizen science in order to bring up knowledge, to bring up evidences, and to help cycling people uh, to avoid, for example, uh, thieving, uh, steals of the bike, bicycles, or improving the community with different, different actions. So these projects were also, we were inviting a number of colleagues in order to be our advisory board and to have feedback to these projects. And we have a resubmission um, stage with their comments and suggestions, which was Claire, Raydom, and Joseph, uh, any of you known for known by, by some of you. So what we are what is happening in the in the pilots during these um 12, 18 months? For instance, if, if we can have the, the, the empowering urban cyclists, they are developing their own app. So there is also an inclusion of uh, not only public institutions, but also private private institutions as well. This is a pan-European action, so it's not happening just in one place, but an app that is going to be distributed in different places. Imagine we have here data issues that we have to solve. We have here engagement issues from different countries where we should put our server in one country or every country have their own server, et cetera, et cetera. So with this, we can bring up questions that are related to what happens when you open a citizen science project that is based in one country to a different country, and you have to solve legal issues, for instance, or data management issues. So here, one of the elements that, that I, we thought that it is essential is the empowerment of the, of, of the researchers that are learning as well. So some of our researcher community, they were quite experts in citizen science. The others was the first approach to that. So it was very important to create this team, right, of mutual learning community, as I was mentioning before. It was very important also to develop this, uh, this approach, to be developing this approach of public engagement with public administrations and also with uh, civil society. So as you can see, with this mapping, we are trying to create as well an, a narrative, also a visual narrative, in order to try to identify the, the quality value, that is the added value that is provided by the multi-stakeholder engagement in the citizen science project. All right, so you were mentioning that before, um, capacity building is very important. And for that reason, one of the uh, actions that we were having in the uh, Smarter Academy, uh, in the Smarter Project, was the Smarter Academy in itself. And um, one of the pillars of this Smarter Academy was open science. So we decided to also create a citizen science and public engagement course together uh, with UAB and also CONAS University. Um, uh, which is equivalent to two ECTS. And, and this is very important because what we wanted is that to be consolidated within the educational framework of the ECU University and the, the offer of micro-credentials that uh, ECU University is providing as well. So for that reason, we created this two, two ECTS module that first was offered to 
R1, R2 researchers, so it was citizen science for researchers, learning to design a citizen science project to understand how to assess it, to understand how the data management is, uh, different types of, of involvement, different types of problems, and also the social aspects around that. So this is for researchers. But in addition to that, we adapted it as well as a 2CTS micro credential that in this case, is implemented in one of the subjects of the smart city degree. This is a three years degree that is going to be now a four years degree in which you have the subject uh, models of urban innovation and citizen science. And here citizen science is used as a tool for that the students can develop their actions in the territory, in, in, in the field, right? So we are teaching them from the uh, classical point of view, how to use citizen science in order to get evidences from, uh, from, from the territory. And this is very important because this, from my perspective, if we can consolidate this approach for capacity building into the digital wallet for micro-credentials, micro this is something that will stay uh, forever, let's say, in the curriculum, in the CV of the, of the students that are happening to our university. So this micro-credential approach I think it is very important. The project in which we are developing that is also the campus as a little lab, which is a completely different topic. But if you are interested in how to use also the campus as a small city in where to develop this challenge-based approach for problem solving, I will be more than happy to share with you. So I'm finishing now with my presentation. Uh, it was in, presented first in, in the uh, in the initial uh, speaker from the commission that we are here about the science. Yes, it is true. Science and scientific outputs is the, is the base of citizen science, but not only that. We are only having a um, uh, um, strong commitment for the scale of engagement, for the depth of engagement, and for tackling the benefits for all the stakeholders. And for that reason, we aimed a number of explicit goals that try to, to tackle these um, four dimensions, right? So with a number of KPIs in the project that we are advancing on that. First, to consolidate a baseline of researchers. I was speaking before as the alpha users, right, of our communities. These alpha users are people enthusiastic with good knowledge. They are not only experts. They are people that can drag other members of the community. So it is very important to consolidate these alpha users in our communities of mutual learning. Then to, to increase this, our platform with more researchers, we were engaging more than 156 researchers and project managers in citizen science, but it is important to consolidate it in a sustainable way beyond the fact that we have some funding attracting them to cooperate with us. Now we are waiting to have new, uh, new actions uh, drinking from the project that we already are having. Then we have uh, a number of researchers contributing for the recommendations and specific uh, workshops in the conference that I announced we'll have in 2023. The second goal is to develop a curriculum for citizens and methods and tools at pre-graduate, graduate, and PhD level. So I'm very much um, willing to contribute in this um, approach that was uh, identified before from the academy. We are advancing a bit on that. So please let us know if, if, if we can collaborate on that. And the fourth goal is to identify needed changes at institutional level to make citizen science one singular landmark of the ECSU challenge-based approach. This is very important because it was mentioned before, um, we, need, we need to have changes. Uh, the university has been working so far is no longer having the right tools that allow us to, to, to unleash the power of public engagement and citizen engagement. So we have to be brave in order to identify these actions. I'm sure that I'm very much aware that we're having a number of good examples afterwards from the rest of the speakers. So we have to be humble in this transformation action, but we have to, to be also sure about what we want to consolidate. So we're aiming at consolidating the goal one, which is the KPIs of the mutual learning community for 2023. We are very, quite, quite optimistic about that. And to identify the roadmap for tackling goal two, goal three, and goal four, we have very good news regarding the potential uh, fund, new funding um, for research uh, in which citizen science is an, is an, an elevant uh, tool uh, from now on. And finally, what do we suggest in order to get this whole, these, these goals? Well, there is an, uh, the first one, which is very general, right? And I'm finishing with this, Florence, is first the acknowledgement of cooperative versus competitive science. 
There is high quality cooperative science that approach to new KPIs or to new identification of the results that we are having and a new way of understanding their research career with people that definitely want to do cooperative science versus competitive science. And this is also in the context of excellence science. Then create a common evaluation framework for the four dimensions of impact because we need to assess to what extent we're doing things right. Um, we don't have that yet, but we are advancing on it. Probably this is something mid-term, mid I would say. Then regarding the citizen science curriculum, uh, we are starting with our one and our two in which project design, implementation and impact assessment are one of the bases so that people that are responsible of carrying out tasks for citizen science can do that with, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm not saying homogenized, but at least a common framework and then integrate citizen science as a challenge-based learning instrument at the university level. This is a methodological approach that has to do with the pedagogical tool, citizen science, in order to have evidence-based results for challenge-based learning. The goal three, our, our whole, our, let's say, hint would be to develop the concept of mutual learning community as the base of, of developing citizen science projects as we are researching here and to include researchers in the process from the scratch. We develop, develop this approach for the co-designing the, the three pilots that we are finishing in September, including the research from the beginning. I think that this is a very, very good uh, hint because then there's an element of legitimacy and empowerment based on the ownership of the process that is happening. And thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Florence. And sorry if, if I extended a couple of minutes with that. No worries. Thank you very much, Fernando. It was great to hear about your project. Um, so we are a little bit behind time, but we we had managed to uh, to find some minutes, so it's okay. Um, so now I will leave you to a break, uh, a well-deserved five-minute break. Um, so I ask you to resist the temptation to look at your inbox and instead try to go grab a refreshing drink or uh, pet your dog or your cat. Uh, or if you're like me and you forget to water your plants, uh, it's the time, five minutes, and we see you back here at 31, 11 31. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back, everyone. If you are uh, with us and you can open your camera, that will be great. So I will know that some of you are with us. Oh, wait, fantastic, amazing. Perfect, great. So next uh, we have uh, presentations from three exciting projects. Um, so once we've heard again from all the three, uh, we if we have time, we can dive into Q and A's. Otherwise I will ask uh, the presenters to have a look at the chat if there are questions specifically for them. Uh, in fact, um, if you have a question, try to specify the name of the speaker you're addressing. Uh, so this way it will be easier for them to, to see if the question is for them. Um, so the first presentation is about the incentive project with Dr. Maya van der Berg, based at the University of Twente, where she's involved in establishing the university's uh, citizen science hub. Uh, based at the design lab, she's managing multidisciplinary research and innovation projects, uh, bringing science and society while focusing on societal challenges. Uh, Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Florence, and thanks uh, very much, Ola, also for uh, being here, of course. Um, as Florence nicely introduced already, this is the incentive project that I'm going to um, take you along um, in the min minutes ahead of us. Um, this has been a coordination and support excellence, uh, action funded through um, the grant and agreement that you can see here on the screen. Um, we are two, two years old um, at, the, at the moment, so I have also some insights that I can already also share with you. So the incentive project is um, seeking to promote um, responsible research and innovation through citizen science. So we very much are aiming for RPFOs. So that's how we are referring to the universities that we're that we're targeting, research performing and funding organizations um, that we want to yeah, support with um, making sure that they can they can carry out organizational changes to actually promote responsible research and, research and innovation, RI, and also what it takes um, to actually implement citizen science in their institutions. So that's what we're, what we're looking for. So we're building the bridge between RI and citizen science, and we very much also are doing this in a practical uh, way, because what we're doing is we are establishing, testing, and evaluating um, so-called citizen science hubs in four European universities, um, four corners of Europe. I will show it in a minute on the on the map that we also have included in the presentation. And we have defined a citizen science hub to be a space where citizens and scientists and people from different groups can join forces for scientific excellence and also horizontal deliberation. So it's very much a place that we that we are building um, where, well, place in a curriculum, place in research, and also physical place where citizens and researchers can actually meet themselves. So that's what we are aiming for. Um, and as you can see here in the map shown um, um, on the slides, we are coming from four corners of Europe. We're coming from the Netherlands, uh, where I'm based, so that's the University of Twente, but we also have a pilot university based in Lithuania, which is Vilnius Tech. Um, we have a partner also from Greece, Aristoteles University of Thessaloniki, who is also testing very much on establishing the citizen science hub and to find out how that what it takes actually to implement something of a new organization like this, and also what it what it means for the institution and also for the surrounding funding landscape. Um, and we also have the university where Fernando, actually the previous speaker is coming from UAB. So that's the University Autonoma in Barcelona. So these are the four universities that are piloting this so-called citizen science hub. And as I said before, we are two years old, actually even a little bit more, two and a half years. Uh, we're together with nine partners that you can see here in the bottom of the, um, of the slides. Uh, so there's universities, there's there's also um, the EXA, for example, also involved with us. We have um, uh, Bocconi joining us and also the Sin Science Center in Zurich, who is very um, uh, much also a forerunner in, in establishing citizen science in universities. And we're supported by Wide Research Q Plan um, as, as like the primary partners, making sure that's, that our um, uh, project is running, running smoothly. 
so that's what you can see here in the, in the um, um, yes, main highlights of our of our projects. And let me take you along also in the the projects. Um, yeah, like overview. Um, what we want to do is we want to like support and help European universities first and foremost. But of course, there's more partners that have a genuine interest in what we're what we're doing. But we want to like increase insights into the factors, the drivers, and the barriers and motivations um, that that actually come with making sure that that citizen scientists and stakeholders are engaging with uh, citizen science in your in, in your university, and what incentives are needed for them to actually also well step in, but also stay close with you. So also what it takes to community uh, to to build a community that Fernanda was already also referring to. Um, so once we have like identified this landscape of stakeholders, we also are co-creating with citizens and also with the local stakeholder groups. We are we have been actually already co-creating these citizen science hubs. So we have been in co-creation workshops, bringing all those different stakeholders together, making sure that we are developing the citizen science hub in such a way that it very much also fits the local and the regional requirements that come with it. Like in these different very different countries. Um, like the the, yeah, the institutional and also the, the the local context of the ecosystem are very different. So that's what we what we wanted to do. So this was very much of a tailored approach that we that we did. Um, and of course, also the universities are different. Like there's a couple of the universities are more the generic traditional um, universities. Also, like especially you would be in Aristoteles, also are larger compared to Vilnius Tech and University of Twente, which are small, smaller scale technical universities. So also that was included. And now that we have identified the, the well, say the framework for the Sin Science Hub, so we have identified also operational models and uh, governance structures for, for that. We have then also been bringing those, those requirements into practice because we actually have been testing also to build these, these hubs themselves, to actually have them running. So we had various, um, activities to actually bring these, bring all the stakeholders together uh, with the aim to really also enhance scientific literacy. As we mentioned before, scientific literacy also as one of the reasons for engaging with citizens um, to really also focus on local problems, local issues that we want to um, want to tackle, to bridge opinions and to create this space for future citizen science, also for the future. So very much so the, the future was also included in the project. Um, and as we were doing all of this, actually monitoring and assessing was also like a big, big part of the work. So we have been establishing uh, quite an extensive monitoring and evaluation model that is being also tested during the, the new project. And with the project ending actually January 2024, 20, uh, we are going to deliver a methodological guides and policy recommendations on how to design create, operate, and sustain a citizen science hub. So for all of you have an interest, this is what we're going to work on in the coming months. Um, in November, 1st of November, we will have also our final conference where the first insights will be shared. So please be aware, you're more than welcome also to join us. Uh, but there's, there's, so there's also these deliverables coming up um, for you. And let me also take you along. So um, as I said, we have been piloting us in the last few months. So this is a picture that we took uh, during actually our open house here in Twente. So we had citizens actually visiting the university. As you can see here, that there's a wooden box in front of these uh, friendly gentlemen. They could pose a question uh, for which they would also very much like to engage with society. With society. So we had a very nice day. Uh, we had 300 questions addressed by the general audience. Um, as a way to yeah to connect us in the future to the regional society and have yeah start working also on questions that really also these people like very much, um, and we also have kids joining us um, just introduce them to science in general, particularly also trying to find questions that they like very much. Um, so that's also something that is that is happening. Just like invite people also to the university makes a big difference. There's a big interest actually also just seeing what is happening at the university. Um, and this also happened in Greece. So this is a picture from um, Aristoteles University where they had, um, um, yeah, like a, a workshop with citizens also on on fake news and also how to how to yeah define that also that. You can see at the back of the screen there's also um, one of our researchers having just discussions with the audience, the general audience, 
on how to deal with this. So we did actually a lot of also hands-on activities, including including citizens. Very nice. Um, and let me back. Yeah. So so the last slide I'm going to share with you. Um, here are some pre preliminary lessons that we have learned so far on really grounding citizen science in the different universities. Um, it is in January 24 that we're going to publish our final policy brief, but we can already here uh, share with you a couple of like preliminary insights. First, we, we see that promoting citizen science um, awareness really, really comes with, yeah, like visualizing, making, making it tangible. So we suggest strongly to, um, we have to, to, to also show very much, showcase what citizen science can, can mean in practice for all your stakeholders. Um, once, once there's, there's like awareness raised, um, sharing successful experience is also very, very important. So communication um, in general is, is key, inspiring the general public um, that, that science in a way is not scary or something that is outside of their or outside of their daily lives, but actually you can turn it into something that is interesting, something that actually also make a difference. Um, also, we recommend that, that science um, yeah, well, actually, like the po policy priorities, uh, and to re relate that very much also to scientific research questions, um, is like a is a, is like a very good combination to make sure that that science becomes relevant. And actually, if you do this on a regional and and local level, in the case of universities, include very much also the local e ecosystems. Um, you have you have a perfect combination also in, to include your citizens. Um, and so the the, the citizen science hubs. Creation, uh, make sure that actually you're working also very much on the infrastructure when, when developing um, a new concept, new organization like, like this, making sure that, that also in the preparatory phase, you are considering your infrastructure. Um, so the monitoring evaluation is something that we took quite seriously. We have an entire work package dedicated to this. So make sure that you define clear targets so that you can actually well measure, that you can actually also show the impact of what you're doing, both to policymakers, also to citizens, and also to researchers. And make sure also that you're explicit about what works and also what does not work. Uh, do, do, not, do not hesitate to also share that. Um, and what we have experienced very much is to have, uh, you can maximize your, your impact very much through engagement. If you have tailored capacity building and awareness activities, especially including also marginalized groups, um, that, like it's possible and it works and actually also in uh, it's it's a it's a perfect way to maximize your ma maximize your impact. Um, so with with that, I'm concluding for now our preliminary lessons. These um, reflections and and these these recommendations that you can see here, including also what we have not learned during the project, will be um, as you can see in the time box will be discussed at a, um, um, a round table taking place 18th of September um, together with the Time for CS project. So that's um, coming up, making sure also that we can also um, further refine our policy recommendations. Um, and last but not least, all of the four different uh, citizen science hub will also work on so-called action plans so that also these citizen science hubs will also still operate also when incentive is no longer there um, so also the sustainability issue is something that we very closely look uh, look into. So that's it, uh, Florence. Those were the points that I wanted to do to, uh, to share with you. Very curious to also hear from the audience if there's questions. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, so again, I will invite everyone if they have questions to write it in the chat and Maya, you can answer them um, since we are a bit behind time. Um, so uh, for our next speaker, uh, we'll present the Utopia project. Uh, her name is Eline Livemont, who is currently coordinating the outreach and communication department at the Vice Rectorate of Research of the Vige Universiteit Brussels in Belgium. Uh, welcome, Eline. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So my story I will present today um, is, is actually based on the work of, of my colleague Floor Keersmakers, who couldn't uh, be here today. So all credits to her, but I will speak in her name. So I will focus on the Utopia Train project uh, and the support of the integration of citizen science uh, in its partner universities. And, and it will also illustrate um, the work that has been done at our university that also fits into this European project. 
And in the end, I will uh, show you how fruitful this two-way dialogue um, has been. So if we go to the next slide, so normally I can, ah, voila, sorry. <laughs> Voilà. So here you can see uh, the different universities that are part of the um, Utopia Alliance, the University Alliance, um, and the Utopia Train Project sponsors academic innovation with societal impact, or better, yeah, it's committed to promoting a connected and inclusive academic community through a deep. Um, oh, this this is going automatically. Sorry. <laughs> To a deep uh, engagement of the alliance with its local and uh, regional ecosystems. So the project links uh, the research communities of the partners with the local and international needs of multiple stakeholders, uh, from the formulation of a research agenda to its execution and uh, the dissemination of results. And, and this is why citizen science holds a prominent place in the third work package. I'm sorry again, <laughs> there is this automatic um, thing in the presentation. Um, but just to be clear, so we are part of Work Package 3, focusing on open science and societal outreach where citizen science has been embedded. So now I can really go to the, the next slide. So what are um, the milestones and, and the deliverables? So we, we needed to do two training sessions and an online and also develop online training material. So it really made sense to look um, at our target audience to identify what the focus and content of these deliverables should be. So um, yeah, if you, if you want to know uh, what you have to offer uh, or what you need to do uh, to support the research community, you really need to know who is looking for support and which support they actually need. So that's why we started off with an extensive mapping exercise. Uh, so using research portals, uh, universities, press and communication websites, Google, of course, uh, but also the screening of funding calls um, and uh, different uh, yeah, approved uh, or not, not approved applications. So while we invited these people to join a community of practice, we also asked them to fill in a survey to get a clear uh, view of what we should focus upon uh, and to encourage this community to actually meet, exchange and build connections. Uh, we launched uh, the clinics. So these are peer learning sessions. Um, as you can see on the slide, it was really uh, the goal to strengthen, strengthen the work of the community of practice, create a supportive atmosphere and spark opportunities for further cooperation. It was very informal. It was just an hour, very low effort. Um, and it was also recurrent every six weeks. So we, people really knew, okay, the next one uh, is on a topic that is uh, interesting for me. Um, I also want to... Um, yeah, uh, join in to exchange my um, experiences or to learn or listen to others' uh, experiences on a specific topic uh, related to citizen science. Voila, then we can go to the next slide. So we also needed to uh, organize some education training. We, so we um, co-organized two webinars with uh, Unica, with another alliance. Um, and the first one was focusing on how to engage citizens in your research. And another one was uh, about the successful strategies in applying uh, for citizen science funding. Uh, these, the both of them occurred in 2022. And then we also made some online uh, learning uh, training materials. And um, we already finished three of the four modules. We're currently finishing up with the fourth module. Um, and we also uploaded uh, this online training material on Zenodo. Um, a new, so a new version will come probably in September, October, when we really revised all of the, uh, the, the new um, interactive model, model four. But uh, yeah, we really saw that there was um, a need, although there are already a lot of training, um, yeah, training, learning materials, uh, resources available. Uh, we saw that it might be good to have like a starter kit where people can already see what is out there. Um, so the first one is start to learn about citizen science with also a lot of references to interesting reading material. Uh, the second module is about, yeah, if citizen science is actually right for your research with also a lot of uh, nice references to uh, key resources. 
And then the third one is the crucial design factors for citizen science project. And the fourth one, and this is really nice, um, we, we try to make something more interactive, um, ha having some templates, checklists, uh, key considerations um, that researchers can really use to see if uh, citizen science, if they can use it, in what way they can use it, uh, if they have to have uh, specific attention to certain uh, aspects of their research, like data management and how to do that. So we really try to make it very interactive and also applicable for um, a, a large, um, yeah, um, community of, of researchers that are interested. So we'll definitely let you know when it's out there. Um, and we also have a new um, design of the whole uh, starter kit. Uh, so we're very, we're really looking forward to share this uh, with you all. So that was an important deliverable. And then we had our third milestone, the dissemination event that took place in uh, May of this year. So how European University Alliances can support citizen science. Um, so <laughs> you can see the program, but yeah, a lot of these discussions, we already heard uh, some of the, the points or the, the difficulties or the, the opportunities uh, as well um, in other alliances or universities um, that are yeah, that are going on. And we really took this uh, to deepen our, our knowledge and to share experiences. And we closed this event with the, the ninth and the, and the last clinic, yeah, closing the clinics lessons learned from the utopia citizen science peer learning sessions where we also uh, went through um, our yeah, conclusions or opportunities challenges that we mapped that i will also further explain uh, in this presentation so what are we doing uh, currently so we also had to uh, we also had the deliverable of a citizen science education and support service for the whole uh, alliance, which is quite a challenge. So um, the idea is to have a local division of each partner at each partner university, but to work together very closely in setting our goals and approaches uh, and exchanging experiences. So after a series of working group meetings um, in early spring of this year, uh, we decided that the bottom line of this um, education and support service should be uh, to not exclu exclusively focus on the researchers, but also provide training for supporting staff. So for example, um, in order to start uh, the education and support service and keep it running, uh, yeah, the member should first be able to gain interest in its activities and thus, yeah, to say, yeah, find clients, but would, we could also help them run their own citizen science clinics, for example, or provide a guide or scripts for workshops based on the starter kits. So these are just a few ideas. We're still working on this. Um, so in a new project, Utopia More. Um, for the research community itself, uh, we will make sure there is a single point of contact for specific questions and support to integrate in uh, their citizen science work in other aspects of their work as well, such as teaching, um, and also to educate researchers on the potential of and good practices uh, in citizen science. So we will provide training, organize inspiration events, and possibly also introduce some incentives or other stimulating and inviting tools or practices. Um, of course, as there is already a lot of things going going on out there uh, beyond this alliance uh, that's also why we're all here we will definitely uh, keep a close look on everything that is um, being organized new materials that are um, published um, interesting information sessions that we can also share uh, with the alliance then what is our conclusion so um, as the European Citizen Science Association indicates, yes, yeah, citizen science is rather an umbrella term and then a fixed concept. So um, many who have practiced citizen science can agree that in this approach in particular, no size fits all and every project is shaped by unique specific circumstances and meets its own challenges. And I also think that uh, 20 with the incentive project, they also set yeah, a hub. It really needs to uh, be compatible with local needs and uh, local opportunities. 
So due to this elusive and uh, unpredictable nature, the support of citizen science has much to gain by peer learning and sharing experiences within the framework of strong and fruitful networks such, such as a European University Alliance. So we were very happy that we could learn uh, a lot uh, by doing this together with all of the other universities. Um, so just to show why we came to this conclusion, maybe I'll start off with some uh, challenges so I can finish with a positive note of uh, opportunities and strengths. So in general, uh, working on one task uh, in one work package in a huge alliance or project might not always create the most efficient collaboration. So that's what we experienced. So not all partners are equally familiar with the topic and therefore also not aware of colleagues within their own institution who might be interested in the work that has been done in the work package as well. So um, it can be challenging yet yeah, to define a common ground and vision um, in case multiple partners are involved. Um, and also, yeah, working according strict planning with deliverables and milestones that need to be achieved um, with partners um, you have to answer to. So means also that meeting deadlines and um, yeah can be can be challenging. And sometimes it feels like you really need to rush uh, forward. Um, so sometimes this allows little time to stand still and reflect and really evaluate, readapt uh, your course. Now, for Utopia in, uh, specifically, uh, there appear to be quite a variety. Um, sorry, I, I forgot to <laughs> go on this. Yes, sorry. Um, now you can see the slide that I was actually commenting on. Um, so I was um, already discussed the general, but for Utopia specifically, um, so there is quite a, a variety in the importance uh, that the different partner institutions attach to citizen sciences. So um, as our dissemination event also showed, uh, it was often linked to the research policies of regional or even uh, national governments, providing none or only very little centralized support for citizen science initiatives. So likewise, the interest uh, and expertise in citizen science with researchers can differ quite a bit because of these circumstances. So the number of community of practice members were not the same uh, for each individual, individual partner university. Um, for example, the, the VUB uh, research community was quite present uh, during um, this um, community of practice uh, learning, um, yeah, mutual learning uh, workshops, for example. And then um, finding a approach that appeals to researchers and staff in all different positions and at all different stages of their career, yeah, that's an impossible task. Huh? Um, although there are tips and good practices to be found, yeah, there is no single handbook or guide that guarantees you'll be able to keep th this community of practice alive uh, and um, yeah, be of an added value for all people involved. Then if we go and look into maybe the more the opportunities and the strengths, um, then we can say that in general for researchers, so exchange with colleagues who work on a similar topic or in the same field, but in quite a different context that really can enrich the experience. And for both researchers and supporting staff, yeah, connecting individual networks, um, yeah, they, uh, they also, we saw that they really got connected into a bigger network. Um, so information travels much more quickly. And then for Utopia specifically, uh, so the format, as I already said, it was, um, yeah, you didn't need preparation. It was very accessible. Yeah, it took place um, recurrently. So people could really join when it suited them and they didn't have to prepare anything. So it was very accessible. And then, yeah, in all modesty, of course, a lot of support by uh, the research management and council um, yeah, was VUB as a forerunner, a driving force. So yeah, we had the strong networks and expertise and room for trial and error, which, which of course also helped uh, for this Utopia uh, project. And we will yeah, try to continue um, all of the things that we have started uh, in Utopia more. 
And then, yeah, what's next? I'm not going to delve too deep into this because this is all still under, uh, yeah, we're still discussing this, but we are now so part of the digital transformation task. Um, and we will yeah, see the muscles and deliverables are anchoring open size in the Utopia communities and expanding the training portfolio. We're still seeing what we will do um, exactly. And then uh, connected communities implemented and activities in place is the milestone. So yeah, this support and training will be directed to Utopia's connected communities, groups of lecturers, teachers, researchers, and students working on a particular team or topic. Um, so as much as possible, we will integrate these activities uh, within the further development and working of the citizen science education and support service. So thank you for your attention. And I saw that there were some questions in the chat, but I ignored them during my presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, thank but... you, Elise. Yeah, thank you. Uh, perhaps you can answer the questions in the chat. Um, again, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's 12. I apologize for being over time. We have one last presentation from uh, Claudia uh, about the time for citizen science. So if you can stay for the last 10 minutes, that would be amazing. Um, so Claudia uh, is from the Agency for the Promotion of European Research in Italy, where she works as a project manager, mainly on science and society relationship related projects. And uh, again, she will talk about time for citizen science. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Florence, and good morning, everyone. I will try to be quick since we are running a little bit behind. Uh, Florence, will you share the screen for me? Yes, uh, Carmen. I don't know if it's only sorry, me, but my, I don't, my yeah, computer I don't know if it's only me. Yeah, I apologize. I think the PowerPoint was not opening. If if you have, uh, Claudia, the presentation with yeah. you, that yeah, would yeah. be amazing. I'll give you uh, the access to... Perfect. Mm -hmm. You should be able to share your screen now. Just I apologize for that. Oh, now I can see it. I don't know. It was not me sharing it, but I can see it. Okay, but Carmen, you're sharing. Yeah. It was me. It was my computer. It was perfect. <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so my name is Claudia Yasil, and I'm the coordinator of the project Time for CS. As a matter of fact, the project is coordinated by APRE, which is the Agency for the Promotion of European Research, but we are 11 partners and we span across nine European countries and we, are, we have a very strong consortium of people really interested in citizen science. And I must say that we are also sister project with Incentive because as a matter of fact, we have been funded under the same call. So we share the similar objectives. And also, as Maya and Thomas were mentioning, we are organizing a lot of uh, joint activities because it makes sense since we are really uh, sharing the same objectives. We are two years and a half, so we are almost at the end of the project because the project will finish this, uh, this December. So we can share with all of you some of our results. Our general objective is to facilitate the implementation of sustainable institutional changes in research performing organizations to promote citizen science as a research methodology. Uh, this is like, it's a, very, it's a very ambitious objective. So we wanted to make it practical because as a matter of fact, institutional change, it's a long-term process. It's something that requires a lot of effort. And it's something that in our opinion, it would have been too ambitious to promise that uh, beginners institution could achieve an institutional change in the lifespan of European project, which is three years. So we started defining what really at proposal stage, what is an institutional change. We define some characteristic, of course, thanks to the literature. And in our idea, basically, uh, an institutional change has four main characteristics. So it has to be irreversible. It has to be comprehensive, meaning that it has to be, it has to go beyond the, just changing in uh, procedures and norms, but it also has to include the change in the mentality of people that are inside the institution on both sides, governance and also researchers. It has to be inclusive. So in this 
uh, institutional transformation, you need to include the stakeholders in the dialogue and in the process since the very beginning and work with them and make the institutional change really relevant for the context of the different institution. So it's a combination of two things. Basically, it's a combination of a change from an organiz organizational perspective, so changing procedures, norms, policies, guidelines, but it's also changing uh, it's also a change in the social approach. So you also need to include change in the mentality of the researchers and people which are actually implementing citizen science. So this was our beginning, the definition of the institutional change. And thanks to this, uh, we design our concept. So basically we identified four intervention areas, which are areas where some practical activities are needed in order to trigger the institutional changes. And we call these practical uh, activities that the different research performing organization can implement grounding actions. In the, in the consortium, we have basically three types of partners. We have the so-called front runners, which are European research performing organizations, which already went through this process. So they could share with other partners and then of course with the whole community. Uh, their experience and what they learn thanks to this process on different level and with different approaches. On the other side, we have four uh, research performing organizations which are implementing institutions, which are testing this methodology that we design. So they define some uh, personalized roadmaps, including some specific actions that they wanted to implement during the lifetime of our project in order to achieve this institutional change to promote citizen science as a research methodology. So this is our general concept, but as a matter of fact, behind our concept, there are some publications which come from the uh, LERU. In particular, there is the citizen science at university, so trends, guidelines, and recommendation, and also the open science and its role in universities, since of course, citizen science is part of the general policy of open science. So, Without going too much into the details of this publication, but basically this publication were the basis for us for some definition and some concept that we are testing in our project thanks to the activities of our implement implementers. So basically uh, there is the need to develop for the university a program of cultural change. And there were in this paper about open science and its role in the university, some recommendation about how to uh, really promote and implement the open science. And they were using this concept of the roadmap. So making some personalized action plan with some specific steps to achieve and some timing to follow that we also, uh, let's say, bring in into our concept. So that's what we use for the definition of the roadmaps of our implementers. On the other side, in the paper about citizen science, there were some specific recommendation about how to really implement citizen science at university levels and for in, uh, therefore in research performing organizations. And you can see that there are different uh, aspects. Some of them will have been already discussing during the, the conversation this morning. So it's about, of course, recognizing citizen science. It's about having a point of contact inside the organization that could be really a reference for researchers that want to use citizen science as a research methodology. It's about raising awareness. It's about having infrastructure and that can really allow for citizen science to be used. And it's also about, for example, adapting the research evaluation system, taking into account also the citizen science practices. So what we did is basically we use this concept to define these intervention areas that we think are the areas where institutions have to work if they want to achieve this institutional change. We define research, education and awareness, support resource, resources and infrastructure, and policy assessment. In each of these areas, we define some specific actions. This was something that we did at proposal stage, thanks to the literature, uh, the papers that I was mentioning, but we also did uh, during the, our project, so the very beginning of the project, thanks to expertise of our front runners inside the consortium that could share with us and with the implementers some of the practical things that they were already really doing at the university level for really promoting citizen science. All of this actually was also complemented by uh, an analysis of some case studies. So we had a very, in the first year of our project, we did this analysis of some case studies, uh, not only in our organization. So we had 38 uh, case studies that were analyzed. 
And basically, we wanted to identify the drivers of the successful institutional changes in order to promote citizen science. So first of all, there were some preposition, proposition that they were the basis, let's say the condition that we wanted to test if they were you know, working or not. And there were things like, I don't know, belonging, for example, to a citizen science network or having already citizen science project inside the organization, having some citizen science champions, so researchers which are successfully using citizen science and they are recognized inside the institution and by the community as uh, citizen science champions. All of this, uh, basically, these conditions were analyzed, and all of this basically led to the definition of some uh, uh, 11 conditions that can really uh, support uh, the implementation, the integration of citizen science as a research methodology. Thanks to all this work, and of course, in this, of, we, we can find again citizen science champions and the opportunities of having funding available, the support for researchers, so infrastructure, contact point, or the citizen science hub, as Maya was mentioning in her presentation, all of this can really contribute to the integration of citizen science as a research methodology. We also define some uh, different stages of the institutional transformation because institutional transformation is a long way process. So there may be institutions that are in the very early stages. There are some that they may already be, let's say, halfway. There are some others which are more advanced. And depending on the different stage where institutions are, the kind of, let's say, condition that can really support more and more the integration of citizen science are different, and there are different drivers that they can contribute to citizen science. So this was our, let's say, uh, main results. This was also used by our implementers in the implementation of their specific roadmaps. And they, uh, the process was uh, very um, context related. So each institution was choosing what kind of actions they wanted to implement at their local level, discussing also with the stakeholders. And it was really a combination of work between research support staff, so people which are supporting researchers and researchers as well that were really working together in this process. Uh, if you are curious about our results uh, and if you want, like we are in the phases where we are sharing with the communities what we found and what we learned and we really want other institutions to test and try our methodology. In all this process, we are also developing, for example, some indicators for individual and institutional changes that can support citizen science because we have, of course, uh, a, a very important phase of impact evaluation of the impact of our activities and our methodology on, with our implementers. But of course, thanks to this, in, this activity, we are developing indicators for institutional changes. Uh, we have some training activities. So we are developing uh, training programs across the four different intervention areas. We have also some uh, uh, series of webinars, which are public webinars that we are also sometimes organizing together with incentive or with access. So we are always trying to collaborate with projects which have similar objective than us, and they are publicly available. So uh, you, you can, of course, follow us and you can test this, uh, you can try this training. Uh, they are for different targets. Some of them are for researchers, but we are also addressing research support staff because in all this process, uh, the research support staff, it's very relevant and it's very important. We have the reflection tool. So the reflection tool, it's a very easy tool. Uh, that could be really useful for organizations that they want to start thinking about what they can practically do to implement and to integrate citizen science inside their organization. So thanks to this uh, tool, they can define their specific grounding actions following the process and thinking about who to engage, who to involve, and define the grounding actions that they can, uh, they can work inside their organization. We have some networking tools. So we have the Citizen Science Helix on the CrowdHelix platform. So you can, you know, if your organization is part of the CrowdHelix network, you can subscribe to the Helix and we are sharing the uh, news about citizen science and we are creating opportunities for uh, interaction, integration, and working with other citizen science practitioners. And especially with uh, who is interested in how citizen science can really be root and uh, integrated at the university level. And I, all of all the things that I was mentioning, of course, they are available, publicly available. We have, a, we have a time for CS community on Zenodo. So I suggest to all of you to, to follow this community and like having a look at our material, you have our contact. And so 
I would like to thank you for your attention and I will check if there are some questions for me. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia, for your presentation. And thank you, everyone, uh, for staying uh, 15 minutes more uh, to this first part of the event. Uh, again, a big thank you to all our speakers. Uh, it was very insightful, all your projects and initiatives. Um, and I see that in the chat, I think it was also very useful for several of attendees uh, to listen to you. So thank you very much. Um, so now we will have uh, less than an hour uh, for a break uh, as we head into lunchtime. Um, so we look forward to having you all of you back uh, at one CST time, again, using the same Zoom link. In fact, I will not close this meeting. So if you prefer to stay, uh, close your camera, no problem. Uh, we will leave the meeting open. Uh, and for those who uh, won't be joining us uh, this afternoon, uh, we would kindly ask uh, your help for filling out a short survey evaluation uh, that will provide us feedback about the first part of this event. And of course, your input will be very, very much appreciated. Um, so yeah, voila, thank you very much. And we'll reconvene uh, at one. Thank you very much, everyone. And I will share the link to the survey right now. Thank you. <laughs>